Chapter 4 Last Words You can't trust his eyes. You can lie with yours, he can lie with his. Watch his hands, they won't lie. Long sword on his right hip, parrying dagger on his left. With the scabbard fastened to his hip, he doesn't have enough room to draw the long sword with his right hand. He can draw the dagger with either hand. He'll push backwards off the table to get space to draw his sword. Press the attack, then. Force him into the wall before his sword comes out. Throw the mug to distract the dagger. Hurdle the table. Let sword come free of its sheath. Strike hard and fast. You need to kill this one, Link. Silence. This was a rarity for Link. In his first, and technically seventh, year as the Hero of Time, his companion Navi had never allowed the boy a moment of peace. Listen! She'd demand. Look out! She'd cry. Watch its patterns and strike when its shield is down! She'd instruct. At the age of ten and seventeen, Link had managed to save Hyrule and defeat Ganondorf. Twenty years his senior, Ganondorf had been a powerful sorcerer, a renowned general, and a horrific warrior. Yet Link had prevailed with the help of his fairy's instructions and wisdom. When Navi left, Link thought he could learn to appreciate the oblivious silence. His ignorance had left him robbed, cursed, and damned by a deity with an imp puppet. The cataclysm that ensued had taught Link to replace the silence left by his companion's absence with aberrant situational awareness. But once he'd lit that torch, he couldn't put it out. Except in moments like this. In moments where every cell in his body was focused on the threat that sat 54 inches away. Link could no longer hear the drunken lullabies of the six men across the room. He could no longer taste the remnants of mead on his tongue. He could no longer smell the smoke of the torches that adorned the walls. He could not even see the tavern wench who was only three feet and seven inches to his left. All he saw, all he experienced, was Sir Marcus Brutus, the Demon Slayer. Watch his hands, Link. I was wrong! With his eyes glued to Link's, Marcus's right hand shot straight down, not across to his hip. His fingers wrapped around the hilt of his longsword and pulled the blade out and to the side, upside down in his hand. Instead of kicking the table to move back, Marcus kicked his chair back and threw his upper body atop it while swinging his sword far into the right. Reacting instantly, Link's left hand shot to his weapon, lifting it up sheath and all to block the inbound attack while his right hand scooped up his half-empty mug and threw it at his attacker's face. The knight's left palm was there to stop the liquid-filled projectile and protect his face. The inverted sword in his right hand passed through the air. Flesh, bone, flesh, air, cloth, flesh, cloth, then air until it came to an abrupt halt against Link's sheath. A cry from the waitress who'd been slashed across the hip. Only silence from the seated patron whose cervical spine had been severed. Link kicked off the table and backed up to draw his steel from its damaged sheath. Marcus slammed his palm hard against the table, pushing himself over its side toward the stumbling injured girl. He rolled off the table's side and landed on his feet, dagger now in his impossibly fast hand. Ernie! The girl cried as she fell against the floor. Just as the name left her mouth, the formerly charming knight slammed the tip of his sword through her ribcage. For less than a quarter of a second, the man left his sword planted there, held up only by the shocked woman's dying body, while he reversed his grip on the hilt. He had his primary weapon properly in his hand, and up in front of him long before either the woman died or Link's feral attack began. With his shield out of reach, still on the table, Link held his broadsword in both hands and slashed vertically, aiming for the knight's clavicle. A powerful attack, but easy to deflect. The tip of the longsword dropped below the broadsword's edge, then swept it up and harmlessly to the side. A perfect envelopment. Deem! The bartender bellowed. Link pulled his elbow in tight to bring the tip of his sword facing Marcus's left hand. A smile from Sir Brutus as he fainted with his dagger, then slashed with his longsword. You are familiar with Rangcap's style, Marcus said as his slash was parried. Longsword and dagger. Link growled, trying to maneuver to the left to keep his body between the rest of the civilians and the homicidal knight. An unusual combination, but deadly when mastered. The reach for the sword provides the offensive power while the cocked dagger plugs the holes in his defense. The dagger can strike out like a snake when it becomes ignored. Link had seen this style before, but never with this sort of proficiency. Aware of what Link was doing, the knight leapt far to the right, defeating Link's measured movements. A whirl of blades followed after the knight's feet. Everybody back! 
the bouncer called as he plowed through the bar. His greatsword was one-third out of its sheath. Seventeen feet away. Without his shield, Link had been driven back and overwhelmed. He couldn't risk countering the longsword without the dagger sneaking past him. He was trapped on the defensive. Each one of the Demon Slayer's attacks was powerful, swift, and accurate. His feet danced beneath him, always protecting his center of balance. His hips bounced forward then backward, complementing his lunging blade. You bastards! The bouncer roared. All but the tip of the massive weapon was free. Eight feet. Marcus sensed the bouncer's proximity and pivoted on his foot, meeting the massive sword inches from his head with his own longsword. The great sword grinded down the edge of the longsword until it was harmlessly off to the side. Deem tightened his grip on the mighty weapon and swung horizontally, hoping to at least force the knight into the man in green. The knight had no intentions of being coerced anywhere. With more grace than the bouncer could have imagined, Marcus leapt over his sword, tapping it with his dagger just in case, somersaulted through the air until he was planted firmly on his feet to the side and behind Deem. The retired mercenary now found himself standing in the middle of the two troublemakers. At first, Deem wanted to resume attacking the man who had killed Beth, but the knight was backing away while the man in green was advancing. He turned on Link, two-handed sword flying diagonally upwards. Link cursed under his breath and swatted the sword aside with ease. The too long weapon neutralized to the bouncer's side. Link stepped forward and brought his right knee up to his chest. Like a meteor crashing into earth, Link's foot collided with Deem's sternum, throwing the man backwards off his feet. The 250-pound man was in the air for 1.8 seconds. In that time, Marcus took the arm off a would-be hero with a knife, Link dove to the side for his shield, and Ernest fumbled with his crossbow. Despite the suddenness of the blow, Deem managed to hit the ground and roll backward up to his feet. He knew he was dangerously close to the knight now, so he didn't bother looking for his sword. Instead, he drew his cudgel from his belt and spun around. Both Deem and the knight knew it was nothing but luck that placed the club in the perfect position to block the incoming longsword. You are in my way, my friend, Marcus said with a frown. I'm no friend of... A dagger slid between his fourth and fifth rib, piercing his lung. Deem's whole body seized up except his damned fingers, which closed to release their grip on the bouncer's last weapon. Brutus's forehead snapped forward, breaking the bouncer's jaw and sending him into unconsciousness. The blood-soaked dagger came up just in time to defend against Link's renewed attack. Your scabbard was secured to the chair, not your hip. Marcus grinned. He had learned that trick from a most dishonorable military priest while he'd been tracking down Beelzebub. He knew someone of Link's caliber would appreciate the move. Armed with his shield and determined not to let any more innocent lives be squandered, Link's attack was brutal. His powerful legs drove him forward with each swing of his sword. When Marcus could not back up fast enough, the edge of Link's shield would whip out with enough force to break bone. Marcus tried thrusting out his dagger, but Link was prepared. He had bluffed an opening when he raised his shield a little too high while striking with his sword. In the same instant, while parrying the broadsword with his long blade, Marcus's left hand whizzed forward. Just before the dagger was buried in the bed of flesh and guts it so loved, Link's shield crashed down atop the knight's wrist, breaking more than one bone. The dagger clattered to the ground, hungry and unsatisfied. Too close. Not even a grimace from Marcus. The man who had slain Hell's most dangerous denizen did not panic when the tide turned. He doubled the pace of his backstep, ensuring that he maintained the advantage with the reach of his superior weapon. Link would have closed the distance easily enough, but one of the supposedly too drunk to fight men had chosen to join the fray instead of retreat out the door or against the wall like everyone else. The man barreled into Link's sword side, shoulder first, feet clumsily driving forward. Unwilling to skewer the drunken innocent, Link had no choice but to accept the tackle and go to the ground. In the 180-degree roll, Link managed to strike the drunk thrice with the hilt of his sword. The man was knocked unconscious after a second. Marcus took advantage of the distraction immediately. He lunged forward, thrusting the tip of his blade at his opponent, who was still down on one knee. Link barely managed to get to his feet, but was unable to plant them beneath him. He stumbled backward, frantically trying to maintain his balance and preserve his life. The body of the bouncer finally stole his balance as he fell backwards. He could feel the panic in his chest as he knew without a doubt that he didn't have enough time to roll forwards onto his feet before the knight ran him through. For the third time that night, Link was wrong. He made it to his feet in time to see Marcus hacking away at the arm that had reached out and grabbed his foot, robbing him of his victory. 
Severing the arm wasn't enough. Irate, Marcus stomped on the skull of the temporarily conscious Deem. The blow fractured the skull and splattered even more blood across the floor. The bouncer's legs spasmed and kicked as the last of his neurons fired randomly. Marcus looked up for his fourth victim. Link was staring at him with hate and disgust. Why did you come this close to Hyrule? Marcus asked, slowly moving to the side. Link squinted at the murderer. Why was he still talking? They were now the only ones left in the room besides the owner hiding beneath the counter, the unconscious man who tackled Link, and the man bleeding out from his arm wound. Is he stalling? I was in Termina to see my sick godchild, Link answered. The two were now circling each other. My friends, Cafe and Anju, spent a fortune sending messengers after me. I just left Termina after leaving them with a miracle drug. Ah, no good deed goes unpunished. Link rotated the sword in his hand. I guess not. Thunk! Link stumbled backwards, shocked and confused. He didn't have time to look down and see the crossbow bolt protruding from his lower chest. Marcus could see it. Marcus knew victory was his. I missed. Ernie was shaking with fear and disbelief. The evil knight that killed Beth and Deem had his back to the owner, yet he had still missed. His shaking hands and frayed nerves had gotten the better of him. The owner of the bloodied crossguard tavern could only stand there in shock as Marcus Brutus charged the wounded man in green, swatted his sword away, sliced the man's exposed calf, then plunged his longsword through the man's side. The man in green, the man who had been trying to protect the patrons, the man Ernest had shot, barely let a cry escape his lips. This is not the ending I had expected, the knight said as he slowly pulled his blade from the man's body. The man in green leaned against the wall and allowed it to guide him to the floor. His sword was out of his reach, and his shield hung uselessly at his side. I wasn't <clears throat> expecting that crossbow, the man in green managed through ragged breaths. Marcus turned and gave Ernie a puzzled look. Ernest swallowed nervously. His legs were refusing to move, and he just stood there stupidly with the empty crossbow hanging at his side. Neither was I. He turned back to the dying man. I am sorry your end has to come in such an inglorious fashion. He sounded truly apologetic. Ernest flinched when the door opened. A man in a black cloak and hood entered, bloodied sword at his side. His horse is dead, the man, really more of a boy, said to the knight. The knight lifted his broken hand. Unnecessary. Link won't be trying to escape. He tapped the man in green shield with his sword. You were right, you know. My squire would have rushed in if you had proven too much to handle. Innocent lives and a partner. Your foresight was phenomenal. Grief, not pain, was painted across the wounded man's face. You... you killed Epona. Ernest could see tears trickling from the man's face, getting lost in his beard. The knight knelt just in front of his downed foe. Your mare lived a life as noble and thrilling as your own. May you ride through the plains of the goddesses with her. The man in green spat in the knight's face. The squire stepped forward, lifting his short sword up. Why are you still standing there, Ernest? He asked himself. Marcus put his hand up to stop the advancing squire. You know nothing of the word noble demon slayer. Fire burned in the dying man's eyes. Marcus slowly brought his hand up to his face and wiped the red spittle away. It is a shame you would use your last breath to wound my pride. I always imagine the hero of time accepting death as though he were an old friend. What of the bartender? The squire asked, pointing his short sword towards Ernest. The bartender's feet finally started working. He backed up, fumbling in his pocket for a second bolt. Master Ernie will tell everyone that Link defiled his establishment and slaughtered his patrons, Marcus stated with only a side glance at the frightened bartender. There was no question as to whether Ernest would tell the truth or not. The squire twisted his mouth disapprovingly, but made no advance towards Ernest. Marcus turned his attention back to the paling Link. Any desire to replace your last words with more appropriate ones? For a moment, the man said nothing. He only lied there, gentle tears rolling down his face, while his chest struggled to rise and fall. Would you allow me to play Epona's song one last time? The man finally said. 
Marcus put his hand on the man's shoulder as though they were old friends, as though he hadn't just run him through. I will. With a thankful smile on his face, the dying man reached into his tunic and withdrew a small blue flute. Hands shaking, he brought the instrument to his lips. His first breath failed to produce any sound at all. I haven't played in eighteen years, he said apologetically. The man in green lowered the ocarina, took another pained breath, then tried again. The most sorrowful notes Ernest had ever heard emanated from the blue instrument. The notes were powerful. Despite all the bloodshed and horror of the evening, Ernest found himself closing his eyes and relaxing. The notes washed over him like a drug. The music slowly changed as the man played it. Individually discernible notes became a myriad of sounds, musical and otherwise. The old hairy man leaned back against the cabinets, relishing in the noise. Ernie! cried Tommy, one of the regulars. Give me a drink for my new friend here. Ernest opened his eyes. Did I doze off? He wondered. It wasn't like him at all to fall asleep while working, especially not while standing. The old hairy man blinked his eyes twice and looked about the tavern. The cross guard was filled with the typical bustling, rough housing and, of course, drinking, as usual. Ernest glanced at his worst best customer and his new friend. The stranger was dressed plainly, but very well groomed. Ernest pushed off the cabinet and reached under the bar for a bottle. You gonna pay for this or is it going on to your never-ending tab? Tommy pointed at Ernest and simultaneously winked while clicking his tongue. Ernest shook his head, but poured a glass for the stranger anyway. Tommy nudged his near-empty glass forward, ready for the expected refill. So, what's your name, friend? He asked, succumbing to Tommy's prompting. Marcus Brutus, the man said, lifting his glass to thank the generous bartender. Oi, your friend's over there, Sir Link. Without pausing, Link strode all the way up to the bartender who'd nearly killed him. He didn't bother glancing over towards his seated friend. That crossbow you've got back there, Link said in his sternest voice. Give it to me, he demanded. He set his bloodied hand on the counter to emphasize how serious he was. The bartender's eyes doubled in size. He started to stammer something, but stopped, thinking better of it. With a glance over Link's shoulder, the man disappeared for a second, then reappeared with the unloaded crossbow. In one swift motion, Link grabbed the cord of the weapon and ripped it away, splintering the contraption. Only five nervous patrons, one bouncer, the owner, and a knight noticed. My horse needs oats, Link said, dropping the remnants of the crossbow on the counter. W which one is yours? The owner asked in a frightened voice. Link turned to face the knight, who was still seated. He has to stay seated because his scabbard is tied to the chair. The one with the corpse in front of it. Before Ernest could call for Deem, warn Sir Brutus, or even leap back, Link had his sword and shield drawn and was charging at Marcus's table. He hurtled the table before Marcus's blade had left its sheath. You have to kill this one, Link. To be continued.